Stoner. I'm the department head for public health sciences, and I want to start by uh, offering a land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge that Queens University is situated on the lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee, and we are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. Um, it is my pleasure today to uh, introduce for a, uh, a uh, special public health sciences seminar series, uh, Lampros Bisdunas. Uh, Lampros is a, currently a visiting research student in the Department of Public Health Sciences here at Queen's University, working on a project around sleep and rest activity, rhythms of people at high risk of developing bipolar disorder. He's working with Dr. Ann Duffy, who is a, a, a faculty member in our department, funded by uh, the UK Research and Innovation at MITAX. Uh, he completed his BSc honors in psychology at the University of Glasgow and is uh, MRes in clinical psychology, methodology, and statistics at the University of Amsterdam currently a PhD student uh, in the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences and the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Oxford. So welcome Lampros and uh, we'll let you take it away and uh, share your screen. Hi Brad um, and hi everyone. I'm really sorry I can't be there with you to present in person but um, my funding uh, mandates me that I kind of travel around and visit a lot of labs so that's what I'm doing this September. Um, now, can you all see my screen? Yeah, good, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. Well, yeah, so my name is Lampus and I am in my final year of a PhD in Oxford. So I work between the departments of clinical neuroscience and psychiatry, and I'm currently a visiting research at the Department of Public Health Sciences at Queen's University. Um, my research and the topic of today's presentation is around the role of sleep and circadian rhythms in uh, bipolar disorder. So a brief overview of um, what I'm going to talk about is first I'm going to introduce sleep. You know, what is sleep and why, um, why is it important? Then I'm going to talk about sleep disruptions, first as symptoms of bipolar disorder, then as risk factors, and then as treatment targets. Um, finally, I'm just going to briefly mention some ideas about future directions of this research area, and then I'm going to open up the room to discussion and Q&A. So first of all, um, you know, what is sleep? And before we introduce sleep, we need to introduce biological rhythms. So biological rhythms are periodic phenomena that oscillate uh, with a specific kind of time frame. Um, there's three broad classification. There's ultradian rhythms that have a cycle of less than 24 hours. So processes that follow ultradian rhythms are kind of bre uh, breathing, blinking, your heart rate, pulse, things like that. Then we have circadian rhythm, so processes that follow a 24-hour cycle or about 24 hours, with sleep and wakefulness being the most prominent one. However, we also have body temperature and digestion that follow circadian rhythms. And finally, we have infradian rhythms, processes that follow a cycle of more than 24 hours, so processes like menstruation, hibernation, and migration. However, as you can imagine today, I'm going to focus more on circadian rhythms. And circadian rhythms are endogenous processes. That means that they do not require rhythmic input in order to oscillate. However, these processes are entrained by exogenous cues. And what this means is no matter where you are, even if you are in a room with kind of no idea what time of the day it is and no windows, you would still follow a 24 hour cycle. These 24 hours might not be completely in synchrony with the light dark cycle outside, but it would still be roughly 24 hours. But in kind of a daily life, these processes are entrained by exogenous cues, environmental cues. And the most prominent one is the light dark cycle. And now that we've kind of put sleep in a biological context, we need to define this. And there's kind of two ways to define sleep. The first one is the obvious one, is what everyone thinks of as sleep, is the behavioral definition. So in kind of fancy research terms, we think of sleep as a uh, time where people show decreased consciousness, perceptual disengagement, physical quiescence, a combat posture, and eye closer. However, um, in terms of a neurophysiological definition of sleep, which is also a lot of the times that we use uh, in chronobiology research, sleep is defined in two broad categories. There's non-rapid eye movement sleep, non-REM sleep, and rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep. Non-REM sleep is further divided into three stages, uh, going from non-REM 1 to non-REM 3, and these actually indicate a continuum of sleep depth, with non-REM 1 being the lightest uh, sleep stage, and non-REM 3 being kind of what we call deep sleep or slow-wave sleep. 
And then we have the parasympathetically uh, driven REM, uh, tonic REM sleep and the sympathetically driven phasic REM sleep. Um, so these are kind of the kind of two ways to think of uh, sleep and defining it. Um, and in terms of its assessment, um, I would also classify the assessment types in two categories. There's self or clinician administered measures and lab measures. Now, most of our work clinically would um, kind of require self or clinician administered measures. Most, most of sleep or skin disorders do not need um, lab measures. So we typically use clinical interviewing, sleep diaries or questionnaires. Um, a sleep diaries are a kind of like item that is kind of unique to our resets, but it's just a journal. So we ask people to basically talk about their feelings and uh, behaviors around sleep. There's some predefined questions and some of them are open um, free text answers. And then we also have lab measures. So actigraphy is one of them. And this is just a measure of acceleration and they usually look like watches that you put on your wrist. So things like um, Fitbits or Apple Watches, imagine this, uh, the research version of this, basically. Polysomnography is a group of assessments uh, that we use in sleep, and it's considered to be the gold standard of sleep assessment. So polysomnography includes things like an EEG, electrocardiogram, um, electromyogram, and we use this to get macrostructures of sleep. So understand wakefulness, non-REM and REM and the percentage and the timing. But we also get microstructure elements of sleep. So uh, the frequency and amplitude of different brain waves and things like that. Um, then there's circadian phase tests. So uh, typically the most common one is melatonin uh, onset. But uh, some people also use uh, core body temperature or um, cortisol to kind of define circadian rhythms. And then there's also the multiple sleep latency test. This is typically used for a very specific type of disorders uh, marked by increased sleepiness. So I'm not going to talk about this um, today, but it's just that so you know that these are kind of, this, this is a good overview of all the assessments that we use. And now um, talking about the importance of sleep, I think it's quite easy. I think we all have anecdotal evidence of feeling horrible after a night of really bad sleep. And it's not surprising to know that there's been a lot of research on this and it has shown that sleep is actually is very, very important, obviously for our mental health, but also for our physical health and um, cognitive functioning. So uh, kind of sleep loss is associated with things like memory loss, problems with concentration and immune system, leads to high blood pressure and uh, increases the risk of type 2 diabetes and obesity, leads to decreased sex drive, and um, kind of we also see impaired uh, balance coordination and usually some tremors after kind of nights of bad sleep. So as someone that works in kind of mental health research, I care a lot about the effect of sleep in mental health and mood. However, as a chronobiologist, I also care a lot about sleep disorders. So disorders where the primary effect is on sleep or circadian rhythms. And there's different classification systems, but all of them agree there's seven broad categories of sleep disorders. There's insomnia, which is uh, the most common one. And it's uh, basically an inability to initiate or maintain sleep accompanied by daytime dysfunction. There's central disorders of hypersomnolence, and uh, these are a classification of disorders that have to do with excessive sleepiness, um, circadian phase disorders, um, then sleep-related breathing, sleep-related mood disorders, and parasomnias. Parasomnias are disorders of kind of abnormal sleep-related behaviors. So things like a nightmare disorder or REM sleep behavior disorder that is kind of very tightly related to Parkinson's. And then there's also kind of other unclassified sleep disorders. So we see that sleep is very important for our mental and physical health. So why is it important for bipolar disorder specifically? Well, I always use this quote to illustrate just how important it is. So this is a quote by Emil Kreplin uh, in his book uh, that was published in 1921. And this was the first publication, the coherent publication of what we now call bipolar disorder and was then described as manic depression. So Emil Kreplin, 1921, said, 
The attacks of manic depressive insanity are invariably accompanied by all kinds of bodily changes. By far the most striking are the disorders of sleep and general nourishment. In mania, sometimes there is even almost complete sleeplessness. In the states of depression, in spite of great need for sleep, the patients lie for hours sleepless in bed, although even in bed they find no refreshment. So we see this decreased need for sleep in mania and um, symptoms of what we now think of as insomnia in depression. And although it's been over 100 years, um, kind of these sentiments hold true. So bipolar disorder is defined as a psychiatric condition that is uh, characterized by uh, recurrent episodes of um, hypomaniomania and depression. And the in-between periods are usually uh, called euthymia or euthymic periods, and they are kind of time periods of decreased symptomatology. And sleep is, oh, sorry. Sleep is actually a um, criterion for the uh, di diagnosis of both uh, mania and depression. We see that in mania, we have a decreased need for sleep, and in depression, we have insomnia, hypersomnia. Um, in euthymia, this is more kind of like recently looked at, but we still see persistent sleep problems. We see an inability to fall asleep, increased use of uh, hypnotic medication, and daytime dysfunction. So, um, exactly what Emil Kreplin defined over a hundred years ago. And what is the prevalence of the sleep symptoms? So in uh, mania, we see that the reduced need for sleep is kind of prevalent between 70 and 100% of the population. Uh, usually sleeplessness is kind of one of the most prominent first things you see about a person going through a manic episode. And about 40% of them report symptoms of insomnia. It's incredibly hard to characterize insomnia in this population because insomnia is defined as the inability to fall asleep or maintain sleep, but despite wanting to. So a person in mania might typically say that they're just not tired. Um, so they struggle to fall asleep but, um, because they don't want to fall asleep. In depression, it's very hard to imagine a bipolar depression without insomnia. 100% um, of the population reports some symptoms of it. Um, the kind of most modest um, kind of prevalence of this would be at least 85%. It's very prevalent. And about 80% of them also report symptoms of hypersomnia. Um, so this is the symptoms, it's not concrete disorders. And 70% of people in euthymia report sleep difficulties. In terms of concrete diagnosis, as in meeting the full criteria for a um, sleep disorder, more than 50% of them would meet insomnia um, kind of across um, episode polarity. About a third of them would meet the criteria for a circadian disorder. And again, about a third of them would meet um, criteria for hypersomnia. And typically hypersomnia is um, restricted in periods of depression. However, a lot of this information uh, comes from very small samples. And some of the work of my PhD is to actually better characterize the sleep problem. So for this, we used a kind of really big data set called the UK Sleep Sensor. So it's basically a big questionnaire that my lab does in collaboration with the BBC. And we have over 300,000 responses from this. So it's a very well characterized sample. Um, and what we did from this is we actually took people that self-reported a diagnosis of bipolar disorder by a clinician. And we compared this to match groups that reported kind of never having received any uh, mental health diagnosis and a population that has received the diagnosis of major depression. Uh, now, um, because the, just the sample is just so big, we're able to very, very well control uh, for demographic differences in the sample. So all three samples are matched to the bipolar disorder one in terms of gender, age, um, occupation, and educational attainment. So demographically, they look very similar. And not surprised, the bipolar group reported higher insomnia scores. So that's all compared to health controls, sorry. The bipolar group reported higher insomnia scores, higher dissatisfaction with the sleep, shorter sleep duration, despite a need for more hours of sleep. They typically um, indicate a preference for an evening chronotype, so they prefer to go to bed late and wake up later. Um, actually, one of the most striking was they showed a longer and more frequent napping, increased use of prescription medication for sleep. That wasn't surprising at all again, and more likely to have received psychotherapy for sleep problems. Now, 
the bipolar group did not differ to the major depression one in any of these measures, which again, I wasn't surprised that much. Bipolar disorder is, um, the, in, in its entirety, it's predominantly um, kind of unipolar depression. 70% of the time uh, when these people are kind of experiencing an acute episode, it would be depression. Um, and um, we also use some additional measures of mental health and cognitive performance. Uh, again, all these are self-reported and we saw again differences between the bipolar and the healthy control group. We saw that the bipolar groups had higher depression scores, more frequent cognitive complaints and a reduced quality of life. Uh, here, the only difference between the bipolar and the major depression group uh, was that the bipolar group reported more frequent and more severe cognitive complaints or no other significant differences. So um, there's obviously caveats to this research. Uh, the main one being that all these measures are self-reported. However, uh, there's kind of a lot more measures than we have presented here. And the, the, the good thing is that we had over 3,000 participants for this research and kind of due to the original sample, we're able to have kind of very good tight controls. However, what does the research outside self-report measures show? Now, research showing, uh, research using actigraphy shows um, kind of very predictable patterns of rest and activity. In mania and hypomania, we see increased activity in depression, kind of um, less activity and more variability, especially in the inter-individual level. And in euthymia, we see symptoms are similar to insomnia. The only difference between insomnia and a bipolar group that is experiencing euthymia is actually that the um, bipolar group shows uh, increased duration compared to the people with insomnia. Uh, now, in terms of polysonography, there has been some preliminary findings. The problem is a lot of them are very old, very sparse, and usually they use very, very few people as their sample. But across stages, we see increased sleep latency and REM sleep duration. In hypomania, we see a shorter total sleep time. In depression, we see longer sleep onset latency compared to unipolar depression and control groups. And in um, euthymia, we see a reduction of non-REM2 and an increase in the duration of the first REM episode and the percentage of REM sleep overall. Um, now, the reason why we look at the first REM episode is because typically the first REM episode um, of a night's sleep is very short-lived. Uh, some people might skip it altogether. That's not uncommon. Um, now, this profile looks a lot like what we see in schizophrenia and depression. However, again, the caveat is the evidence is uh, kind of very old and not conclusive in the slightest. Actually, the vast majority of polysomnography research was done in the 80s and the 90s. Um, in terms of the circadian phase test, I think that's very interesting. There is a tendency for an evening chronotype, and that's shown by uh, decreased silum melatonin levels and later dim light melatonin onset. And this group um, also shows increased um, cortisol levels upon waking up, but also as a response to stress invoking situations. So this is kind of what sleep disruptions have been traditionally thought of um, regarding to bipolar disorder. They've been thought of as symptoms, uh, something that presents together with other um, kind of um, symptoms uh, of um, different mood episodes. However, kind of more modern renditions of this association look at sleep um, in a kind of like whole cascade um, and in a broader cascade in bipolar disorder. So one of them is looking at this as a risk factor. So sleep disruptions presenting before the disorder itself, but also before each individual um, episode. Now, this is a figure I adapted from a paper by Pierre Zoffrey that was published in 2018 in Biological Psychiatry. And it, I think it's like a really good illustration of just how uh, involved sleep and circadian rhythms are in bipolar disorder and across how many ways. So the first block um, is the kind of neurobiological diathesis, the genetic predisposition to bipolar disorder um, looked at from a circadian and sleep perspective. So 
We see molecular clock alterations. So we look at circadian genes and see that people that have these mutations or these alterations are more susceptible to developing bipolar disorder later. Uh, this, this is typically relied on animal models. Um, and then we also see light signaling alterations. So people with bipolar disorder typically have a hypersensitivity to light. This is a very new area, but I think it's just incredibly interesting. Um, then the next phase is after the person is born, but before they present with any kind of mood symptoms, we see sleeper circadian disruptions being present. And sleep problems are usually the most potent marker of transition from kind of wellness to any minor or major uh, mental health problem. Um, the third one is general disruptions. Now that's, we see circadian dysregulation, uh, sleep uh, disruptions and monomnetic system alterations related to circadian rhythms and bipolar disorder. I'm not gonna talk too much about this. It's not really my area of expertise. But then what we also see is also sleep problems within bipolar disorder. And we see the sleep problems precipitating bipolar episodes. So, so the sleep problems happening before a manic episode or before a depressive episode. Um, and then obviously these problems kind of persist and continue within the episode itself. And then we also see the sleep problems in euthymic phases. So very quickly about the genetic predisposition. This is one of the most important animal models of bipolar disorder in terms of the association of circadian rhythms. And this is a paper by um, Roy Bell in 2007 in PNAS. So what they did is they actually created um, uh, they actually uh, created a model of deletion of X19 in the clock gene, which is one of the primary circadian genes. And what this happened is that it created a dominant negative clock gene, a gene that is basically uh, capable of binding, but uh, not able to uh, carry out transcription. And what they showed is that mice that carry this uh, mutation, as you can see in that kind of top part of the figure, they show increased dopaminergic activity, but also behavioral pattern that is in line with symptoms of mania. So things like hyperactivity, um, heightened reward sensitivity, increased risk-taking, things like that. Um, and very interestingly, the bottom part of the figure shows what happens when a clock gene um, um, is uh, restored or when treatment with lithium is provided. And what they show is that basically the symptoms decrease or dissipate. Um, and that's kind of what you can see in the bottom part of the figure. Now, I understand this is kind of not the newest type of research. However, it is one of the most pivotal ones in the area. And we've moved kind of past now candidate uh, gene research and there's several other circadian genes that uh, have been involved in bipolar disorder like PAD and um, NPAIS. Um, and in terms of genome-wide association studies, this is a study by Neve Mullins. It was published in Nature Genetics uh, just last year. And they show that uh, after taking information from uh, 40,000 people with bipolar disorder, that they saw um, positive genetic association between bipolar disorder and insomnia, sleep duration, uh, data and sleepiness, and more than this. And uh, even beyond uh, genetic correlation, the polygenic overlap of bipolar disorder and several measures related to sleep circadian rhythms is quite high. So um, this list is by O'Connell, also published last year, shows relationships with chronotype, sleep duration, and insomnia. Now, moving on to kind of looking at sleep in these prodromal phases. So as I said, after a person is born, but before they present with any uh, minor or major mood uh, problems. Now, this is the kind of work that I am doing with uh, Professor Anne Duffy, who is my supervisor at Queen's. Um, so uh, Professor Duffy is working with the Flores cohort, a cohort of people that have a pattern with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And um, they've done amazing work. And after kind of years of working on this, what they've seen is actually that sleep is kind of one of the most reliable markers of um, emerging pathologies. So um, sleep problems are typically the first symptom that presents before we see any problems with anxiety or um, kind of depression, before we see any presentation of bipolar disorder or any other psychiatric condition. And um, 
Similar findings have also been established by the BIOS cohort, which is a very similar cohort in um, uh, Pittsburgh. Um, now, from the cohort that we use, the FLIRES cohort, we see a 1.6-fold increase in the likelihood of, an, of a future mood disorder when a person reports sleep problems um, early on. And in the BIOS cohort, um, bipolar offspring that are classified as poor sleepers are twice as likely to develop bipolar disorder themselves compared to offspring classified as good sleepers. Now, both these cohorts um, typically relied on um, kind of very clinical definitions of sleep problems that would just rely on clinical interviewing. Some other research has tried to do some more kind of like fine-grained analysis of what these problems might look like, and we see that these problems could be increased energy levels, decreasing for sleep, an evening chronotype, and irregularity in sleep patterns or decreased social jet lag. Um, social jet lag is, a, I think, an, just a, like a very interesting measure. It basically looks at the discrepancy between your sleep patterns during the week and during the weekend, or uh, during free days and during work days. Um, and this is the kind of work that I am kind of doing. We're using the Flores cohort that we're trying to do a more fine-grained analysis on sleep and rest and activity patterns um, in this kind of like early stages. Um, and then moving on in terms of the presentation of sleep problems in episode relapse, uh, Thomas Ware in 1987 described sleep reduction as a final common pathway in the genesis of mania. And that kind of like led from a lot of research in the 90s where they put people with bipolar disorder through a, a total sleep deprivation protocol. And they saw that um, after kind of nights of complete sleep deprivation, um, about 20% of the people would develop acute mania. Um, however, kind of more recent research has shown that sleep disruption retrospectively is reported as the most robust early symptoms of mania and the sixth most robust early symptom of depression. And um, a lot of life events that we typically associate with sleep loss have been uh, found to precede the onset of mania. So things like bereavement or very long travel or childbirth. And um, the figure on the right, I think it's a very interesting study in the Journal of Affective Disorders. And uh, Kretel and her team basically looked longitudinally at people with bipolar disorder and they actually found that um, people that in relapse in euthamic episodes report uh, sleep problems, they actually have a much shorter relapse to a new mood episode. So kind of persistent sleep problems are a marker of um, a kind of worse uh, prognosis. So we have looked at uh, sleep problems as symptoms of bipolar disorder, and we also have looked at them as um, kind of early markers. But what about treatment targets? Now, um, in terms of the pharmacological intervention, there's not much right now specifically for sleep. So most uh, treatment guidelines report uh, lithium as a first line of treatment, fluoxetine and olanzapine or um, quetiapine on its own as monotherapy. Now. Um, all of them, apart from fluoxetine, have circadian properties, and most importantly, and most profoundly, lithium. Now, um, lithium response, we know, is partly genetically driven. However, the studies by uh, Michael McCart from 2018 kind of showed a little more about just the pervasiveness of the um, circadian markers of um, lithium response. So what they basically found is that Behaviorally, morningness uh, at baseline predicts a better response to lithium. So if a person reports themselves being more of a morning person rather than night person, the chances of they're going to report better to lithium are higher. And on a molecular level, they actually found that the circadian phase of lithium responders is shorter, or it could be shorter, uh, shortened in vitro. Um, However, um, kind of lithium non-responders, so uh, um, increased sleep phase, and um, they are not very responsive to, they can be increased, so decreasing lithium in vitro. 
Um, so our team kind of did a meta-analysis to look at medications specifically targeting sleep uh, and look at its effect on bipolar disorder. And so we looked at uh, melatonin and melatonin agonists. And basically what we found is that although uh, we see a um, small decrease in sleep symptoms, there's no significant changes in sleep quality or manic symptoms. But this relies on very, very few studies. And most importantly, the most interesting thing is that although these um, RCTs deliver an intervention, a pharmacological intervention specifically targeting sleep, specifically going through circadian pathways, most often than not, they just do not measure sleep at all. And um, moving on to behavioral and psychosocial interventions. Now, um, the treatment manuals that I mentioned before do not really address this. Um, the, I think, do I have information? Yes, I have information about the newest one. Uh, but the, there are kind of behavioral and psychosocial interventions about sleep that have been used in bipolar disorder. And, uh, sorry, these are um, bright light therapy, interpersonal social rhythm therapy, blue light blocking glasses, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, total sleep deprivation, triple chronotherapy, or integrated family and individual therapy. Now, triple chronotherapy is uh, a new type of intervention, and it basically integrates total sleep deprivation, um, the use of bright light therapy in the morning, and a kind of component that's called face advancing. And integrated family and individual therapy is a protocol developed by uh, Professor Miklowitz and it's basically interpersonal therapy together with um, interpersonal and social rhythm therapy. So, sorry, family therapy together with interpersonal and social rhythm therapy. Now, um, there is not a lot of information about these studies in treatment manuals, apart from the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, which published that not only sleeper circadian rhythms should be routinely, routinely assessed in clinical practice in bipolar disorder, but they also recommended the use of bright light therapy for bipolar depression and the use of interpersonal social rhythm therapy as a maintenance treatment, so during euthymia. And um, this is kind of in line um, with what we've seen in our lab with some of our studies. So the figure I have on the right is from a meta-analysis that we performed and was published just the other year. And we looked at all these interventions and their effectiveness in bipolar disorder. And the only one that had enough evidence or enough, yes, enough data to analyze was bright light therapy. And we did see a large, mm. significant improvement in bipolar symptoms. Um, however, uh, just to mention that this treatment manual is also the most recent one that was published. So it does make sense that this is the kind of the first one that addresses this issue. However, what we see from this uh, meta-analysis that I mentioned is that, um, as I said in the pharmacological meta-analysis, is that the majority of them actually do not assess sleep at all. So even though they do deliver an intervention like bright therapy or total sleep deprivation, <laughs> 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 Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so the majority of them actually do not measure sleep or circadian rhythms at all. 85% um, of them do not recruit participants that have a sleep problem at baseline. The clinical stratification is mostly poor. Uh, they usually recruit people at acute episodes and almost always depression. And there's a lack of focus on bipolar subtypes. So we have bipolar one and bipolar two. So there's lack of focus on that. So my final slide is uh, future directions. I have classified this in kind of like two ways. The first one is fut the future for assessment. And this includes inclusion of sleep as a primary outcome together with mood and functioning when you actually measure uh, symptoms of bipolar disorder robust and routine assessment of sleep, integration of sleep diaries, as well as lab measures, and especially called sonography, longitudinal assessments, experimental studies in order to understand the effects of sleep loss uh, better and use of both sleep and circadian markers and outcomes. I know that throughout this presentation, I try to make it seem that sleep and circadian rhythms are one and the same. They're quite different and we measure them in um, quite different ways. And in terms of treatment, 
Um, we want to see the inclusion of sleep as a mainstay outcome in intervention research, not just sleep research, but just across the whole spectrum. Phenotyping of sleep disruptions at baseline and use of this uh, um, in screening participants. So a lot of the times there might include people that maybe did not have as severe sleep problems or that might not mean uh, might not meet the requirements for uh, a sleep disorder. Focus on well-designed randomized controlled trials. There's a lot of kind of non-randomized um, open label trials in this um, area. And another very interesting area is tailored treatment for high-risk individuals presenting with sleep or circadian disruption. So looking at intervening uh, at people that are at a higher risk, higher familial risk of bipolar disorder and intervening with um, kind of psychotherapies around sleep or circadian rhythms. So yeah, that should be everything. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And yeah, I'm happy to discuss this or answer any questions you might have. Uh, give us just a second uh, and we'll take some questions. Um, so I think I'll start us off. Uh, this is fascinating research. Where do you think the future of sleep research is going? Uh, and um, what's, what are the next steps in your own trajectory and, and then for this field? Yeah, well, I, as I spent the last month literally traveling and discussing these things. And I think that in um, a problem that we have is that actually the evidence base for the involvement and the importance of sleep in bipolar disorder is this very rich and quite robust in many ways. The problem is that the integration has been slower than usual. So I think one of the ways that we can uh, move further along with this is actually kind of education on sleep and chronotherapy and circadian rhythms in uh, clinicians and other people that work in bipolar disorders. So I think it's important that this research is perform and done not just by people in kind of chronobiology or people like me who work in sleep labs, but also by people working in sleep in bipolar disorder more generally. I do think that the future is going to be on the predictive value of sleep or circadian disruptions in bipolar disorder. I think we know that it's a symptom. We know that the prevalence is extremely high. We know that it's very debilitating. I think the future is going to be about prediction and um, intervention. Okay, uh, that's excellent. We have we have a question in the audience. We also have a question on Zoom. So we'll sort of alternate back and forth. Maybe you can stop sharing, Lampros, and then we could... Um, yes, sorry, that would be... That's all right. So uh, let's start here with, uh, in the audience, where we have our own uh, Megan McConnell. And I, we don't, it's, it's going to be hard for us to like spin the camera. So I think, Megan, why don't you just, uh, uh, you know, stand up and shout your... <laughs> <laughs> So our national radio station actually had a program this morning about how morning people and night owls might be genetic, might be entirely genetic based on what time of the day your rhythm starts and sets and, some, and that it might not be possible to change that. So what you just said about in respect to Brad's question about it being a predictor would there be value in those in that data? Because I know there's a lot there's a lot of missing pieces for genetic predictors for psychiatric disorders in general. So if they're looking at what time you wake up in the morning as being linked to genetic predictors, is that going to be the same kind of pattern that is going to come into this being a predictor for bipolar or other things, or is that already being is that already a big thing? Yeah, well, I think it's a very interesting question. And um, the circadian disruptions are actually unappreciated, especially compared to uh, bipolar disorder. In our research with Anne, we do focus on both because we think it's just incredibly important. And in future research, we also try to get data for both. There is a genetic predisposition to this. However, um, the kind of most that we know about um, evening and morning preferences is that they change with AIDS. So younger people typically have um, sorted periods, prefer evening, and the more they age, um, the more they have a preference for morning chronotypes. Um, 
sorry, not morning chronotopes. They have a preference for the morning. So um, there is definitely, there's many ways to actually sift the um, circadian phase of someone. So it can be used therapeutically. However, I don't think there's a like a single element that would be robust enough to be that important in terms of prediction. So I don't think that we're going to see, you know, it's sleep quality and no other measure of sleep or circadian rhythm. So it's morningness and evenings, eveningness and no other measure of circadian rhythms. Uh, that is kind of the best for prediction. So uh, I think the future is more about kind of integrating all those measures. And if someone is an evening chronotype and reports kind of, for example, reduced sleep quality, that that person, for example, might not be as responsive to lithium or that person might actually face um, a worse prognosis. So it's integration of a lot of different measures together. Let's go to Nader Gassemlu, and then we'll go to uh, Ann Duffy. Yes, hi. That's a great talk. Um, I was just wondering how... So, so we're interested in circadian biology in my uh, research group um, using mouse models, right, where mm -hmm. we can disrupt the rhythms uh, of the animals by going after the genes, like you had said with the clock delta-19 mutant there. But I was wondering how in the people you can dissociate sleep from circadian um, just because of the, the, the questionnaires. I'm not sure if they are able to really differentiate you know, one from the other. Like there's the brain paper that just came out this past week uh, where, where they, you know, they had people sitting in chairs for 36 or uh, 48 hours and they microdosed them with ca uh, calories and mm. always in you know, dim light uh, throughout the uh, time period to uh, get rid of the sleep effect, get rid of the circadian effect and see what's happening for uh, uh, the response there. And just wondering in, in terms of what you're looking at, um, uh, because you did say circadian and sleep and you know, as, as being two different things. So, so how are you able to dissociate one from the other with your data, uh, with your people? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. I, I, I do, I do think there's uh, differences in the way of assessing both. Right. So, for example, if you deliver a bright light therapy and you're hoping for a differences in circadian phase, and you just deliver a sleep diet, you're probably not going to see that. Or if you assume that the, the benefit of light is through circadian pathways, you're not going to see that with an active watts. So I do think there's different assess differences in assessment. So, uh, for example, in total sleep deprivation, um, there's uh, people use um, face advancing, which is basically just, you know, the person stayed awake for like a whole night. Anything is face advancing at this point. So... I think it's more about the appreciation of the complexity of the circadian system, and including that is sleep. I don't think they are mutually exclusive, and then you have a measure that tells a lot about sleep and nothing about circadian rhythms, or vice versa. However, I do think that, for example, for um, cognitive behavioral therapy, we're not going to know much if we do a, like a DLMO. That's not the primary outcome of this intervention. Uh, this is an intervention that we need to focus on clinical interviewing, sleep diaries, active watches, things like that. But then you have things like total sleep deprivation that should include both. And then you have light therapies that are predominantly circadian. So um, I, I just think it matters a lot for the, I think it matters a lot for the assessment and the appreciation that these are both complex systems. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. No, it does. I think it really goes to the heart of the, the interaction between the sleep and circadian and how, you know, difficult it really is to, to yeah. get at one versus the other and the interactions that each play against each other. It's it's very cool. It's very cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, don't worry. The first thing I do when we do kind of like education protocols for uh, clinicians, I, I, I immediately show them the two process model and, you know, thinking that you can't have one without the other. You can't affect one without affecting the other one. Yeah. No. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have time for one more. Let's go to Dr. Ann Duffy. 
Okay, I was, I was going to comment, but um, so thanks <laughs> for an excellent, excellent uh, talk and for, for uh, doing this and visiting us. And I, of course, am in Oxford while well, you're in Canada. So we've swapped places. I <laughs> can't believe that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that said, um, and thanks everyone for your interest in Lampros's talk. So uh, just to clarify, I was going to, I was going to say, and I, I'm, I wondered what you would think Lampros, but I would say that sleep is generally a major uh, prevention and early intervention target for a number of health and mental health outcomes. And uh, we're looking at it not only in the high-risk population, but in university students, which, which is interesting because of the, the age and also the um, new psychosocial context and, and need for improved uh, independence and self-regulation in university students, which all messes up sleep. Um, but to answer the other question posed by, by a colleague, individualized risk prediction, specifically for psychiatric illnesses, is, is really about what you said, Lampros, it's integrating a number of different biopsychosocial factors. So we've actually done an individual risk calculation model, kind of like the Framingham study, and something like if we could hone down specific parameters within sleep, because in that risk calculator, of course, we have family history, family loading of family history, um, developmental history, psychopathology history to that point, and then including sleep and sleep problems, sleep disorders. But if we could get more and more specific about sleep phenotypes mm. or chronotypes, then that would in, improve our precision of individualized risk prediction. But you have to really have all of those different factors in order to come up with a, with a precise calculation. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I definitely agree with that. Thank you so much for hosting me and, um, and leaving while you me. came. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I'll be in Oxford in, um, two weeks, but, um, I agree with you. And I think that, um, and especially now during my travels, everyone, you know, I try to meet with someone that works in sleep or bipolar disorder. And then someone will email me and be like, oh, I had you here. We do work on, um, obesity and we just became incredibly interested in uh, sleep now or um, I met with a group that works in cardiovascular risk factors in bipolar disorder and they said that they constantly get questions about circadian rhythms and sleep so I definitely think it's a very booming area and um, I also agree with what you said like we can't rely on single items or even single outcomes um, there needs to be an integration of several different elements to um, have a more accurate um, precision estimate. Thank you. I wish we had time for more yeah. questions, but unfortunately we're back up against another meeting, so we've got to call it quits. I want to no thank uh, uh, Lampros Mizdunas for uh, his remarkable presentation and his fantastic research. Thanks to Dr. Ann Duffy for hosting him, and thanks to all of you for coming today, uh, both in person and on Zoom. Uh, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you at a, a future public health sciences seminar presentation.